My message says the birth of Ishmael, the birth of Ishmael. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 16 and verse 2, and it says, a short scripture. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. Uh, sorry, I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Let's read that again. And Sarai said <clears throat> unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Father, Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that you'd bless your word here today, O God. We pray, O Father, Lord, that you'd pour out your spirit, O God, <clears throat> that you'd anoint this preacher, O Father. Lord, that you would move in mighty power, O God. And Lord, that you would just come down, O Father. Lord, minister your word in spirit and in truth, O Father. Lord, have your way, O Father, here with us, O Father. Pour out your spirit, O God, in mighty power. Lord, touch our hearts. <clears throat> open up our ears. Open up our eyes. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, amen. Amen. I just realized I forgot to hit record on this thing. So. Amen. <clears throat> we'll just read that once more since it's so short. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. <laughs> this text is a warning to us about the dangers of straying from the will of God. When God promised something, he means it. God had promised Abram that his seed would be as the sand of the sea and that he would be a great nation among the earth. But as the older Sarah and Abram got, the less likely that it looked in practical terms. So Sarah decided to suggest to Abraham that, that he go into Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian maid, and conceive a child. There are a number of issues with this thinking which we're going to look at. Today, it's a story we all know very well. Ishmael, Isaac, we all understand it. It's something we've all read time and time again. But these stories hold a great significance <clears throat> for us today and for the kingdom of God. You might hear people say that, oh, I only read the New Testament or I don't read the Old Testament. Those people have to be spiritually anemic. You could not possibly, it's, you could not possibly ignore the larger majority of scripture and think that you're going to grow okay. It's like, you know, these children, maybe some of them may not want to eat vegetables or might be picky eaters and, and that sort of things, but that will have effects later on in life. You know, if you, if you try to avoid certain things that are obviously good for you, then you're not going to grow up to be strong or as an adult, you'll have a host of health issues and it's the same thing with spiritual meat. The Bible says that uh, when people were babes in Christ, what did they look for? They looked for meat. But when you get older, you put away childless things and they start to eat spiritual meat, the word of God, the weightier things of the law. You know, the apostle Paul says, I want, it, it should be that I could give you meat, that you should be able to eat it. And yet you're still only drinking meat. Saints, we want to grow and mature. We want to not just be left where we are. Oh, praise God, we're saved, we're going to heaven. That's, that's, that's an infant Christian. That's the infancy of Christianity. That is the beginning. You know, oftentimes now in the modern church, that is considered the end. You know, that that's it. Oh, you're saved and that's it. Go live your life, live whatever way you want. That's the beginning. There is a lifetime of worship, of praise, of study, of communing with God that only begins at that moment of salvation. There is no communion with God before that moment of sancti salvation. There may be sanctification in that God might be working on you before you get saved. You know, you, you might be separated out. You might see a whole host of things going on, but you have no communion with God until the moment that you're born again. The Bible says that what fellowship hath light with darkness. And that's that's why people, unbelievers, do not take of this communion table because this is a table of communion with Christ first and foremost and with the saints here. So saints of God, we must study all of scripture completely, start to finish, not just the books that we like, not just the New Testament, the bits that are easy to read or bits, genealogies included, saints of God, you have to read them, okay? You, it may not be the nicest of all the reading and it's fine to have a favorite book. There's nothing wrong with that. I have a 
have a favorite book in the Bible. It's fine to have favorite scriptures. It's okay if certain scriptures you find difficult to understand. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But that does not mean that we ignore those things. It does not mean that you, you, you can put those things aside. We have to take scripture in its entirety, including Genesis. And so here... The first thing that Sarah does wrong is that she speaks on God's behalf. You'll see that she says, it says, And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Sarah does something very, very dangerous here. She talks on behalf of God. If you intend to talk on behalf of God, then you better be very, very sure that it is of God. I mean to say very, very sure. You will not find the scripture in Genesis where it says that, God told her that he restrained her from bearing. Now it is a natural assumption. You could, you could reasonably argue that God did do that, but there's no moment where a vision comes to Sarah and, and says, God told me this. She says it to Abraham like it is God told her just a minute before that. Whereas actually what God told Abraham, you read of it in the text, that you're going to be a great nation. So if we're going to take two truths here, Okay, one, you can assume absolutely that, that God shut up her womb because that, that, that is a, there's a pattern through Scripture. Fine, I understand that. But if we're going to take these two truths, God having shut up Sarah's womb and God uh, making a great nation out of Abraham, one of these we read specifically in Scripture. God has told Abraham one of those truths and yet uh, Sarah leans on something else and uses that as a precursor to do something she should not do. Well, you might say, preacher, you often say that you're here to speak not about God but on behalf of him. And that is true, but where do we preach from? His word. And that's the only protection you have in this spiritual life. It is not going to be a, a brother Keith that's going to protect you although that is the importance of the role of the shepherd is to protect the sheep but how do you protect yourself against the shepherd Keith is a wonderful man of God but good men of God have gone wrong I am a great friend to many of you here a brother in Christ but how do you know that while Keith's away I'm not preaching heresy you must go to the word of God that is the that is what is going to protect you in this hour that's how you know that the Mormons are not the real church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because their, their doctrine does not line up with scripture. What, what did it say that they continued in? The apostles fellowship, the apostles doctrine, the breaking of bread and in prayers. Doctrine is one of those. Where do you get doctrine? It's not from the Catholic catechism. It is from the word of God. Sola scriptura. That's where we get it from. And that's what we must stand upon. I can say with great authority, God hath said, no drunkard will see the kingdom of God. Well, how can I say that I can say that on behalf of God? Because it says it in the Bible very, very, very clearly. And if a man stands into a pulpit and he decides to preach to you his own opinions, then that's fine. Maybe there might be some wisdom in it, but it does not mean that that is the word of God or that is true or that you necessarily have to wisdom. We, we, listen, sorry. We all have good ideas. We all have things that we are good at in our own capacities, our own rights. If I wanted to look for information on primary teaching, I'm going to go to the trained primary teacher sitting here in our midst. If I'm going to go for someone for treaty printing, I'm going to ask Rory, right? These are in our own things. But to say that if you're not a primary teacher, you're going to hell, or you're not a treaty printer, you're going to hell, or that, that if you don't treaty print on your days off, then you're not godly, that, that would be heresy. We'd all find that ridiculous. Why? Because it's not in the Bible. But saints of God, people always add things into the Bible on a daily basis. You know, there's people out there, Christians, that believe if you're not always a Nazi about recycling your, your, your refuse, then you couldn't possibly be going to heaven because you don't care about this planet, right? People get their own ideas and you might think that's ridiculous. Well, the only reason you consider that ridiculous is because you're biblically literate for the most part in this church. We understand the word of God. We understand that you must protect yourself from it. So in a sense, I'm preaching to the converted. But what? Sarah does here is she speaks on her own accord. I'm not saying that what she's saying is not true. What I'm saying is she says it with such great authority and it seems to me that not, not and it, that, that where it leads to is absolutely bad. Saints of God, if you're going to say the Lord told you, you better 
better, better be very sure. I mean to say, and, and, and I would even go as far as to say, if, you're gonna, if you think God told you something, best to check with the elders first to be sure that it is absolutely true. It is in line with the word of God because saying to God, that can be so damaging. Look at what happens here because of a natural assumption that Sarah makes. It's a natural assumption. There's nothing wrong with her thinking here, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong. She says, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Perfectly natural assumption, but the outworking of that ends up to be detrimental. They end up birthing an Ishmael, uh, someone that the Bible says is a wild man and is against everyone that comes against him. It all starts on her speaking on behalf of God. You can take great authority to speak on behalf of God, but look for it in the text, as long as it is written in the text. Now, I believe that there is um, another extreme this day of the people who are always saying, God told me and God told me. The other extreme is the people that say, God does not reveal himself whatsoever except what is in his word. I believe in visions. I believe in prophecies. There's people out there, they do not believe in dreams, visions, prophecies. And I believe that uh, that is a... Uh, that is a kickback from, you know, modern day Pentecostalism, people who, 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 you know, it's like they have a walkie talkie to God every two seconds. Oh, I heard the Lord told me. I met a man one time and, uh, you know, he was just so foolish in his, in his language and his jesting and like it was ridiculous. He was in his mid to late thirties. He was a father of a number of kids and it was annoying. Like after two weeks of being with him, I thought this is, and most of you don't know him, so don't, don't try to think about it. Uh, but but mo being with him for so long you think oh can this fella just have a normal conversation and yet I'd never met in my life up until that point someone who said the Lord told me more honestly I mean it not once and yet the Lord can't tell you to stop your stupid jokes or your foolish jesting or that your wife see your wife is obviously uncomfortable by the way you're talking and she sees that people think that what you're saying is stupid and yet you can't even you can't even hear your wife telling you to okay that's enough now honey and yet the Lord's talking to you with the you know True, true, um, all the time. Saints of God, there's an inconsistency there. You know, there's people there, they prophesy for the Lord, and yet they're unbelievable gossipers. If God doesn't have control of your tongue, he's not going to use your tongue. That's not to say that he cannot use, that, you know, Jesus, uh, the Lord used Balaam's donkey to, to fulfill his will. But I don't want my tongue to be a, a donkey of Balaam, right? I want it to be sanctified unto God himself. If we're going to speak on behalf of God, we must be very, very sure. Very sure. <laughs> Because God's promise was the opposite of the story she was telling. This is the main thing, is that God had actually promised Abraham something that was different to what she was saying. She said, the Lord restrained me from bearing. And yet God said to him, you're going to be a great nation. Now, did God need his help? This is another issue, right? She says, I pray thee, go into my maids. So not only is she speaking on behalf of God, but now she's thinking up new ways for God to fulfill his will on earth. We don't look for new ways to fulfill God's will on earth. We look for the old paths, like Rory was talking about at this table. We go searching out the old paths, the word of God. Saints, it might be a boring message. You might sit here and say, I'm sick of listening to this fella talking about old paths, but, but, it is, but it is absolutely true. There is nothing new under the sun. That's what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Nothing new under the sun. We're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And saints, if anyone knows me, I like innovation. I like thinking of new and weird and wonderful ways to do things on a daily basis. But within the confines of the word of God, not something new, you know, not these, you know, you might often hear people say, uh, oh, uh, Bible studies now are sitting around and everybody gives their opinion. We don't have leaders. That is a new corruption to what was given to us in the Bible. The Bible says, take men of character that are to teach to everybody else. I love all of you sitting here. I don't necessarily need to hear all your opinions on what the word of God says. That would be absolute confusion. Could you imagine in a home, if one day the, the husband put the couch here and the next day he comes home and the wife has put it there and then the following day, the eldest child has come and put the couch up in his bed. It would be bedlam. It would be absolute chaos. And yet modern day churches are moving around old institutions here, there, taking that away, a little bit of that away, and they think that they're not going to collapse the whole system and think that it's going to continue to run. Ask Brother Paul what happens when you come and take the alternator out of a car, or perhaps maybe if you come and take the water cooling system or one piston out of an engine. Well, you might say, you know, consider this, those pistons, the, the combustion engine is so old, it needs to be revamped a little bit, and 
I mean, why does one piston in an engine that weighs, uh, you know, half a ton, it's only a small little bit, and yet the engine, good luck, it's not gonna run. You take a piston out, it's not gonna run. The person who would suggest that you take a piston out of a combustion engine shows their ignorance in suggesting that. And somebody that suggests to you that maybe a real Bible study is everybody sitting around giving their opinion, all they're doing is showing their ignorance of scripture. They're showing their ignorance of the word of God. Now, you might think that I'm a Luddite and that I would not be interested in that, but when you sit here for lunch after uh, Sunday services and Wednesdays, we often sit and give our opinions. You know, we often sit and, and we wrestle through the word of God. You know, you chew the cud, we remunerate, we, br uh, uh, we bring up the, the word and we, you know, uh, bring it back down. And, you know, we're, we're testing, we're, but, but that's not the, the rule. Right? The rule is a man of God standing here on a Wednesday, on a Sunday, preaching from the word of God. And the rule is a statement of faith. This is what we believe. Now that's not to say you're not trying to figure it out as you go along and you're trying to work it out as you go along and you might have questions and, and things. That's fine. But it's not that every single person's opinion has ultimate authority. You know, you like Brother Paul in his cars, he's got authority when it comes to the realm of cars. I don't, I know nothing about how a, a car works, but if it's Excel files, he'll ask me, okay? That's my realm of authority. I know what I'm talking about. He might say, oh, let's just try that, and it won't work. Saints, I'm using a practical example to show you that men and, men and women in pulpits today are doing this to the church. They're doing it to the word of God. They're interfering with something that was already perfect, and they're thinking, Thinking that they're going to get good results and we will see throughout this message the uh, what ends up happening when people do that when you tamper with God's will when you tamper with the way he intended things to be it is disastrous saying to God God will never ever get you to sin to fulfill his will. You know, you look at, you look at uh, Sarah here asking Abraham, go in unto my maid, that young Egyptian lady. Why don't you go into my mistress and, and, and get a wife from her? You think, oh, how could she possibly manage that? When people aren't thinking of the word of God, their thinking goes very, very strange. And nobody in this church is, is, is free from that. Not me, not Keith, not Brother Jer, not Sister Ellen. Everybody must stick to the word of God because when you deviate from it, strange things start to happen and they start to happen very fast. If you believe that an unsaved partner is God's will for your life, then you are wrong 99.9% .9 of the time, okay? I'm not suggesting that God cannot use situations where uh, uh, we've all heard testimonies of, you know, a, a Christian and was after an unsaved person and that person ended up getting saved. That's fine, but that's not the rule. That is the point zero 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 one percent of the rule. Most of the time, a saved person goes after someone unsaved. It spells disaster. And what are you trying to do there? Well, you're going above the word of God. The word of God says that do not be unequally yoked with unrighteousness. If a cow plow in a field is going this direction and another one's going that direction, the field's not getting plowed. None of the work's going to be done. You go marry yourself an unbeliever, you will render yourself ineffective for the will of God and the purpose of God in this hour. The rule is that we follow after righteousness. We follow God's will. You see, if we go after unbelievers, what are we saying? We're saying, well, you're word says this God but I think you just need a little bit of help you're saying to God that you have not realized the complexities and the nuances of this situation you see God your word is very black and white and and life is there's many gray areas in life and life is nuanced and life is complicated saying to God we make it complicated no let me go on first sin makes life complicated the word of God's very 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 clear very 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 simple why did Jesus say that we must become as little children why did he say it because it's simple it's absolutely simple you can explain this gospel to those children no problems whatsoever if you believe that God's will for your life is a job that makes you work on Sundays, takes you away from fellowship with the saints, and takes you away from the teaching of God's word, then you are wrong. I've met people before claiming to be believers, and they say, oh, God has called me to the other side of the continent to call me somewhere very, very far away, and I just believe the Lord's in it. And you pry them just a small bit and say, what church are you going to go to when you go there? 
Oh, well, the place I'm going is very wicked. There is no churches. Okay, right. So God wouldn't actually want you to be planted in the midst of a church, but God wants you to be rich. When you can find that scripture in the Bible, tell me. Tell me and we'll sit down and have a chat because I've read those 66 books and I've read them many, many times in this nine or 10 years that I've been saved and I have not seen such a scripture. God's not that interested. God actually says, consider the lilies of the field, right? They toil, they spin not, and yet they're clothed fine in Solomon. Consider the sparrows because they go around, they don't store up their meat for the season. They just feed and God feeds them. God feeds them. God feeds them. Saints of God, God is far more interested in your spiritual life than he is in your bank account way more a million times over he's really if you look in the bible he's really not terribly interested in your bank account he is interested in if you've got clothes in your back if you got food in your belly if you got a home to go to if you've got a good body of believers to be around those things are all of interest to god and yet we flipped it topsy-turvy why because we've got an obsession with the things that this world is obsessed with saints even in good churches we have been invaded by the thinking of this world and and that's why when we come to the word of God, it takes continual washings at the brazen laver to get our minds freed and cleared from all of those things that have gone before. Yes, at the new birth, we've been given a new heart. We've been given new desires, new thought process, but there's an ongoing work of sanctification. The Bible speaks about three types of sanctification. That word sanctification means to be separated apart. The first type is before salvation, being separated before salvation. You know, because there's people, many people, we know them. God's obviously doing a work in their lives. Look at Cornelius in the Bible, fasting unto God. God has obviously set that man apart and doing a work in his life. But that's not sanctification in being saved that's not in the moment and that's when you're born again you are being sanctified you are being uh, regularly conformed into the image of Christ and then there's the last sanctification we are going to be saved when Christ comes back and he redeems his church there's an ongoing work ongoing process we are not always there yet the things preached from the word of God may hurt us we may not even implement them instantly but that doesn't mean you should blacken the word of God that doesn't mean that you should take out your uh, you know your AR 47 and start shooting God God for what he has said to you because saints of God it's easy to say okay though you slay me I'm still going to praise you I've sat here in meetings so many times when brother Keith has preached and just ah uh, you know just right there and he doesn't know what he's saying it's God speaking but what's my response you know sometimes my response is maybe upset but I wouldn't put that in my lips you know you go home you work through that but don't don't pick up stones and and and, and throw them at the preacher don't pick up stones and throw them at the word of God or at God himself don't be like Adam and say oh you put me in this situation it's the woman you gave me say yes Lord where else can we go you have the words of a eternal life you know Jesus says that if you if you let the rock crush you you're going to be ground to powder but if you fall on that rock you're going to be broken and that's what God's looking for he's looking for a contrite a broken and a contrite spirit so if you're if the word of God breaks you and causes you to be contrite then praise God you're the type of person that God is looking for the type of heart you know, by, if you have a dream, vision, prophecy, or word, but it does not tie up with God's word, then it's your word and not God's. Can I say that again? If you have a dream, vision, or prophecy, or word, but it doesn't tie up with God's word, then it is your word and not God's word. You know, oftentimes this happens. People in churches slip each other little bits of paper. I remember one time I was doing the School of Christ, and um, we were at the, the that, that Sunday morning, a guy had come into our meetings, a drunk man, and, uh, and one of the students for the school um, had given me a piece of paper for this uh, drunkard, um, which was my, I was only saved about a year, that was my first time ever experiencing something like that. I, she handed it to me and I, I just, I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. I just knew it was weird and maybe something, maybe there is wrong with it. And then that Sunday night, Keith does the do's and don'ts of the School of Christ and he says, don't be handing each other little bits of paper with prophecies on them, okay? Don't be, and this, I'd literally never, like of all days, that day was the day I'd never heard of it before. Someone hands me a bit of paper and Keith's saying, don't be slipping each other little bits of paper with prophecies for, for, for whatever. That person had an unsaved boyfriend and yet she had a word for this drunkard who was sitting in the pulpit. That girl went back home, never went back to church and went off into the world. And yet she thinks that she can speak and prophesy on behalf of God. 
saying to God, we must be careful. First, remove the moat from your own eye before you can take the beam out of somebody else's eye. Saints of God, immediately, all the people I will give, <coughs> sorry, all these examples, they're birthing Ishmael's. They're birthing Ishmael's. Ishmael's are being born that have to be dealt with for 13 years. And it could be ages before you see the promise of God, the actual promise of God. Why? Because we've gotten ourselves down in a rabbit hole. And saints, I've birthed many Ishmael's in my life and not physical ones, thankfully. But I mean, I, I mean things in my life that I've had to deal with because of maybe rebellion in my own life, because of taking my eye off the word of God, because of sin and living unto myself. That doesn't mean that you can just say, okay, Ishmael, males under the blood do you know if you have a child before you get born again you can't just say no that's not my kid anymore you know I wasn't saved so you know all we're new creatures in Christ all things pass away all things become new doesn't work with children right the the judges in this in this uh the judges in this courtroom they're not that's not gonna fly right try tell him that and he's gonna say maintenance payments are required time of yours is required if you have a child that was born before Christ you have a fantastic opportunity to preach the gospel to that soul and let them to be an arrow in your in your arsenal saints of God all of these situations people moving unsaved partners uh, you know words dreams prophecies all of those things you know all of us could probably think of instances where uh, they are used for God's good right and you say but what about this but those are the exceptions they are not the rule if you want to live your life by exception you're gonna it's disaster it's gonna be absolute disaster because most of the time it's not going to work out you're gambling with God and most of the time it, what do they say in natural gambling the house always wins if you try playing a game of chicken with God he's not going to relent you're going to get it and you'll be crushed by the rock and ground onto powder so Sarah's trying to help God if God's going to do something he's going to do it okay he doesn't need our help that's not to suggest that the body of Christ is not God's uh, body on this earth he needs us to go preach and he needs us to evangelize he needs me to preach the gospel today he needs you to sit and listen to it there is no shepherd without sheep to, 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 to lead around right so we understand all those things but God does not need you you don't have some great special revelation for God in this hour okay there's he He's not, he's not saved you out of that muck and the mire and then said, that's my perfect instrument. Absolutely, he desires that for us to work us into that, to be conformed, to be meat for the master's use. But if you think, oh, I'm so great, God needs me. God needs my great ideas. Oh, Jeannie Mac, God, you didn't think of Hagar, did you? Th then saints of God, you need to repent and get yourself right before him because that is not his desire. You know, that was Sarah's idea. And this is the main problem. It was not God's plan. It was Sarah's idea. You know, it says that Sarai said unto Abraham, that scares me the most. She's the one that came up with it. It wasn't the wicked Egyptian. It wasn't Hagar. It wasn't a, a corrupted uh, Abraham. What the, that rule didn't come down from the father, let's say, to then, you know, uh, upset the family unit, upset the, God's plan. It actually came from Sarah. And if you know anything about the Bible, ladies represent the church. The church is always represented as the, a, a lady, the bride of Christ. That's why <clears throat> we don't believe in same-sex marriage here, okay? If if, if you didn't already know that, why? Because the Bible says that the bridegroom, which is Christ, he's a male. That's how he self-identifies, right? Christ is a male and the church is his bride on this earth. He's going to come back and he's coming for his bride. The reason that there is marriage on this earth is not because it's a good institution. It's because of Christ in the church. It starts there. And modern day conservatives love talking about the morality, morality and, 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 and all these things but that's backwards up yes marriage is good for society but that's not why marriage is there marriage is there because Christ first loved the church and died for her and so when you look at it like that Sarah said unto Abraham the church said unto Christ that's what happens when the church has gone wrong. And you see that today, many, many churches, many, many times think of many different things and different ways to serve God. And what do they all end up in? Corruption. Why? Because they strayed from the old path. It's when things are old, barren, dry, that we must be careful not to try change things. Can I say that again? When things are old, barren and dry, we must be careful not to change, change things. It's natural <clears throat> that when there is no life in a church, that the church 
church takes stock of where they are and how to get out of the situation. But this is never done by deviating but from God's word. You don't change direction. You don't say, oh, we haven't had a convert in three years. Maybe we should get the flashing lights. Maybe we should get some strobe lighting. Maybe we're not getting that many young people. We need a worship team, a guy who's not in a suit but in skinny jeans and, and saints, I'll spare you me in skinny jeans, right? It's not going to happen. Thank you, Lord. But this is what's happening nowadays. One time, Hannah and I visited a church on this island of Ireland. And when we arrived in, uh, we were just on a trip away. It was a Sunday. And when we arrived in, the, the pastor's wife came up to us and straight away started telling us about how they have modern worship and started telling us about, and this is, a, this is an older lady, like maybe in her 60s. Her husband is an older man. You'd think he knew the old Pat's well-worn. And uh, she started saying, yeah, we've got, we've got modern worship, um, but we don't have a worship team. We just, you know, we play the songs and then we sing with them. And my heart broke for her because I thought, do you know what? She definitely didn't grow up with this foolishness, but she feels that this is what's necessary in this modern age, is that young people won't sit in church without good worship teams and good bands, and that young people won't come to church for music. If you come to church for music, you must repent, okay? You must repent because the music isn't that good, all right? It's nice. It's wonderful. I'm an okay guitar player, but that world is going to give you far better music than I'm ever going to be able to play for you. We don't come here for music. We come here to fellowship around the Lord with one another to hear the word of God to continue in the apostles doctrine prayers uh, breaking of bread and fellowship amen not the apostles music okay it's not the apostles music if someone tells you that you know, oh, come to our church, we have X, Y, and Z, but it's not in the Word of God. Be very, very wary of them. I know of a, a youth pastor, a youth pastor in a, in a neighboring county <clears throat> that had met up with a young man from our church who had just gotten saved. Young man from our church was on fire for the Lord. He was really just wanting to live for the Lord, and he knew better than this youth pastor, thankfully. That youth pastor says to him, why don't you come to our, our church? You know, we've got loads of young girls. Loads of young girls. We got a football team on a Tuesday night. And he said, what? He couldn't believe it, the young guy, because he'd never heard such foolishness. Can you imagine that? The world doesn't try to ply teenagers with young girls, all right? That fella's like Lot in Sodom, offering up his daughters unto the men outside. You don't know who this young lad is. This young lad was saved from very rough uh, upbringing and all those things. You don't know, and yet you're going to sacrifice the young ladies in your church. I wonder how the fathers feel about that. And yet this is normal. That's a good church. These people worship the Lord. How do you know that what he said is wrong and what I'm saying is right? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. That's your only protection. You don't just believe me because I say it from a pulpit and with a semblance of authority. You look for what the word of God says. You study the word of God and every single one of you, every single one of you has a Bible. You've got a million of them on a Bible. Have three or get yourself an e-sort, give you Greek, you know, Roman, Lithuanian, give you whatever language you want the Bible in, okay? And you can study it for yourself and you can be well versed. Everyone in here, we should have a sword in our right hands and we should be able to defend ourselves with that sword. But you know what? This is the modern day church. This is the church that uh, people look for. This is when the church gets her own ideas and says, God, have you considered uh, my mistress Hagar? You know, have you considered that? You know, I, 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 look, I know you know that I'm getting old and I know you know we don't have any believers here, but I was thinking that maybe we should try this or maybe we should try that. Saints of God, that's what people are doing in this modern day. The modern day church is ashamed of her barrenness and has gone to Egypt for her children rather than going back to the first works. What did uh, God say in, to the Ephesian church? He says, remember your first love. Remember, your, go back to the first works and do what you're supposed to be doing. You don't go looking elsewhere. You know, there was a time in this church where things were kind of sinking down and things were a little bit lower, like what uh, Candace said, 2019. We didn't move in a new worship team. We didn't go looking for young people at youth rallies. We didn't deviate or change direction. We sought the Lord. We pointed that direction towards him again and saying to God, we don't look to Egypt for your children. Why? Because your pews will be full of Egyptians. And this is part of the problem because now it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or it's a never-ending feedback loop and cycle because what's happened is the good people like Sarah have deviated from God's plan. They've filled the pews with Egyptians 
Egyptians, those Egyptians and worldly terrorists have now occupied the pulpits and the only type of people they know how to minister is to people like themselves, not to the real sheep of God. We have goats in the pulpits, we have goats in the pews, we have wolves able to roam around and seek whom they may devour and what ends up happening is that the real believers, they're the ones who end up suffering for it. Very often people message and look through the YouTube on our, look through the comments on our YouTube, you'll say, this is our church, we have no uh, church where we're from. I'm from the United States, no church within a two mile radius. Why? Because pe men have left, they've left, the watchmen have left the watchtowers. People have suggested to God, have you considered my mistress Hagar? And then uh, that we've got Ishmael's in the pulpit saying to God, rather than being patient, trusting God, waiting on him, she devised new ways of creating life and birthing illegitimate children of Egypt in the process. Saints of God, we have to be very careful. Jesus said that straight is the gate, narrow is the path that leads to life, and few there be that find it. In John chapter 10, he says, Verily, this is Jesus speaking, <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. We've reduced salvation to sinner's prayer, to preaching motivational speeches and the church to a social club and places of attendance. That's what the church is nowadays. You know, your focus towards a church and what it is completely changes if you think of it as a place you go to and attend or a place or a people you're a member of. You know, a body of believers you're a member of because when you're a member of a body, that means your responsibility is just as weighty as Keith's responsibility to preach week in, week out. Now that doesn't mean everybody's going to be a preacher, but if it means that you can be here sitting down to hear him preach, that's just as important. Imagine if preach Keith decided on a Friday, Wednesday, Sunday just not to turn up, just said, ah, he's a bit tired feeling a bit sick, small bit of a headache and just said he won't come in that day. Or maybe he had uh, plans with friends or whatever those things may be and just said he wasn't going to come. Well, you'd, uh, everyone would decry that and say, oh, he can't do that, he's the pastor. Can I posit to you today that your responsibility as a sheep in the, pulp, in the pews, in your seats, is just as important as Keats. Just as important as Keats. I, I, can, I thought this years and years ago. I didn't think, always think that way. I remember one time came to church and it was a Sunday. I prepared the Lord's table. I was, you know, up all night, typed out my notes, ready, going to preach. I remember it was on the Passover lamb and I was looking forward to giving my 10 minute exhor exhortation. But Paul was in England because uh, it was when Vic and, and Paul were only uh, um, uh, uh, engaged. And he was preaching, I think, in your sitting room that morning, Vic. And, uh, you know, uh, Keith was away. I don't know, was he in South Africa? There was people, there was about... 10, maybe eight people there, about half of what we normally had. And I remember distinctly getting into the pulpit feeling a sen palpable sense of disappointment in my own heart because I'd really worked on my little 10 minute sermonette. Like I was ready to give my very first Lord's table. And yet, you know, there was no one there to, to help me. And before I stepped into the pulpit, the Lord smote my heart for all the times I decided to not come to church on a Wednesday. Oh man, the Lord just touched my heart and said, Keats preached to less people. He's put in more time than you've done with this little sermon and yet you think you have the liberty to not be there. Saints of God, if there's no one for a preacher to preach to, then what's the point of the preacher? I know Keith would still preach even if there was no one here to preach to the chairs and they'd probably get up and clap their hands and worship too. But, but, but saints of God, our responsibility as members is absolutely vitally important. Now look, I understand my own wife and son aren't here today because he's got a temperature. Didn't want him coughing and sniffling and temperature and on everybody here. So we understand those things, right? These are the natural things, but it's the heart attitude. It's the heart attitude towards the word of God. Oftentimes we think of it as a place, the church is a place we attend and not a body of believers that we're a member of. You are the church and a church, you, we should consider that a church meeting can't go on without the church. That's how it works. And yet this is the modern day, this is the modern day church, right? The sinner's prayer. You've often heard it. I prayed it myself. Okay. So I'm not preaching down to people. I remember being at home, laptop open in my bed before I was saved, video screen. I'd watch something on Aliens, conspiracy, end of days, you know how it is. And, uh, and uh, at the end, there's a sinner's prayer, and I can't even remember what it is. You know, Lord, I'm a sinner, please save me, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is nowadays is that people genuinely think that you lead somebody through a sinner's prayer, and that's it, they're saved. <gasps> we got 10 decisions for the Lord now last week. Can I tell you, I made many decisions before I actually got saved. And 
they didn't all end up in righteousness. Yes. You know, yes. a lot of them were just, uh, you know, they were just <clears throat> me desirous to walk with the Lord. You know, a decision we could make, we could pressure anybody to making a decision. Oh, lift up your hands. The, say the sinner's prayer, you're a Christian. Uh, it's sad that I even have to say this, but that does not make a Christian. And I know I'm preaching to the converted. We're all, we all know this. We all understand this. I'm not saying that a sinner's prayer can't be used for good. I prayed a sinner's prayer. I didn't get saved at that moment, but that's the exception, not the rule. The problem is people say, oh, repeat this prayer after me. Now you're a Christian. Then what happens? They have, they have not been given a new heart. They have the same old desires, the same old thoughts. They might be G'd up a little bit and they go out and they're all happy. But the next day they wake up and they're still the devil that they were the day before. Why? Because they had not been given a new heart. They still had that heart of stone. Saints of God, we must be so careful. Men have reduced salvation to a sinner's prayer. A prayer you will not find in the Bible. And saying, there you are, you're a Christian. A Christian is much more than a sinner's prayer. We've changed preaching to motivational speeches. You know, we watched one of those videos at the AGM one time of a guy, they were, you know, they were making that joke saying, oh, I want, a, I want a sermon, like a TED talk with a little bit of scripture. That's comical, but it's actually true nowadays. And it's so sad. I've watched, uh, you know, I've watched uh, sermons from preachers in this island. And man, they just, it's, it's a motivational speech speech with peppered with a little bit just a smattering of the bible just like a little but not too much you don't want to convict people you don't want to make fe people feel uncomfortable by preaching the word of god so just just a tiny bit to, and just enough to make them feel christian but not too much to make them feel like john knox do you know that kind of way like just just a small bit saying to god this is the sad thing that we have nowadays we do not have people preaching the word. I'm not saying I'm a perfect preacher. Far from it. But if I have led you towards Christ and I've opened up the scriptures and I've pointed towards the word of God and I've not given you my opinion, then then by, the, by God's grace, I have been successful here today. If, we've, if we as a church are led into hope, faith and, uh, and, and love, and charity, then we're a successful church. You know, we had a brother preach that for us, a number, uh, Kevin Gold, a number of years ago. What is a successful church? Hope, faith, charity. That's what it's all about. It's not about uh, dimmed lighting. It's not about big, huge screens. You know, it's not about uh, having trendy pastors, guys who don't wear suits anymore because, oh, uh, those are the old pats. The old pats get your feet muddy. We want nice, tarmac, straight, new Roman roads. Yet the only problem is those old paths were old paths for a reason. People took them because they knew something that we didn't know. Uh, you know, the Bible says, do not remove the landmark that your fathers has put there. It says that in Proverbs. Don't take that away. Because in the modern day, you know, out, outside the church in the world, they bring in same-sex marriage and transgender, all that, all that silliness. And they think that it's not going to collapse society from it. They think that society can just go on as normal when you take away the landmark that your father's put there what does it say in the bible your father's friend that you should respect i can't remember the exact scripture but that you should revere effectively or respect your father's friend why because your father might have known something that you didn't know maybe you mightn't understand or had that same level of relationship but if your father's there to protect you then his friend you should know the bible says about elders they are to be lovers of good men. They're supposed to be lovers of good men. Why? Because who you hang around with is, is, is so important to the life that you lead. And, and the, the people you listen to, the ideas that you assimilate, the things that you consume. The, you know, in, 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 in the world they say, watch you, uh, you are what you eat, right? It's the same in the spiritual. You are what you eat. If you're consuming T.D. Jakes on a weekly basis, or uh, Joel Osteen, or Joyce Myers, or any of these other false preachers, and you start to turn don't be surprised if you start to turn into them. Now, if you've listened to those people in the past and you're convicted about it, that's fine. You just don't need to go onto their YouTube videos anymore, right? There's, there's no one condemning anybody for not, uh, for, for, for not being all that they could be. We're all uh, on a journey to be conformed into Christ's image, saints of God. But saints of God, we, we draw a line under those things. We draw a line under that stuff. We do not change the preaching of the gospel because it makes us, because the word of God makes us feel, uh, you know, you know, convicted. And, and, and maybe might condemn us in certain aspects of our lifestyle. Saints of God, we must lay, hold fast it. And how were they able to make suggestions? How, how was the modern day church able to bring up all of these new ideas? Because they deviated from the word of God. They deviated from the preaching of the word. They deviated from God's promise. God's word to Sarah here, and to, sorry, to Abraham, and obviously down to Sarah, was that you're going to be a great nation. 
If she had just held fast to that promise, she wouldn't have been worrying. She wouldn't have been, half the time we get into trouble, it's because we're sitting there thinking about how we get ourselves out of the holes we got ourselves into. We're just sitting around thinking, oh, I'm after making a mess of it, rather than just saying, you know, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, do you know? And asking for him to change us and move upon us. Bible says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way which lead to life, and few there be that find it. Jesus described the way, the way to life straight, which means narrow. <clears throat> Any attempt by anybody to make it wider than it should be, should be met with great skepticism. Oh, you don't need to do that. Oh, you're a little bit too, you know, oh, that's, I had told, told by an elder of a church before, oh, you're too black and white. You know, you're too black and white. You know, life isn't like that. This guy was an elder of a church and yet, you know, had no problem with, no problem with drinking. He said he needed his bottle of wine on a Friday night. Not the fellow I want to be listened to. No sorry, Bob. Saying to God, anybody who tries to make this gate wider than it truly is, meet them with great skepticism. We had this fantastic evangelist in this church one time. I mean to say literally nationally known. You could go up to the plowing match, up in Offaly, talking to a fella. He's going to know this Christian because this guy is into every town and community all over Ireland, running all of his ministry uh, campaigns and whatever. Very well known, well respected by a lot of people. And he was here with us for a number of months. And... Um, and he said, you know, he, so he'd go, into, he'd go into a town community, he'd put up posters that he was going to be there the following week, and then the following week he would hold that meeting. And I mean, by all accounts, that is not easy work. That is very, very difficult work to do. Um, but when, here in this uh, one day, Keith was away for, for three weeks on South Africa, and that man got very upset that it was Paul and I preaching. That man got very upset. He says, me, a Christian of 30 years, had to sit there and listen to a novice stand in the pulpit. I've been on international radio stations. These, this is not me putting words in us. This isn't writing, right? I've been to international ministry. I've been on, on, uh, I've been on radio stations all over. People ask me to preach here, there, and there's some. And I had to sit there and listen to this novice preach, saying to God, the reason that man considered himself so successful in his preaching is because he would never preach against Mary. That's what he said. First day he ever came into the church, he stood with me, Paul and Keith, and he was just chatting. I thought nothing of it, and, uh, but Keith knew. And he stood and he said, um, you know, when I go into these places, I don't preach about Mary. I just let the gospel work. That man's adding to this Bible or he's taking away something. The, they did not say that with the idols of Ephesus. They had to go away and tr throw away and burn their witchcraft books. This great evangelist used to have all these testimonies of how he would use these Marian halls, as he called them, basically community halls attached to churches. And he would use these halls and he would say, these halls, uh, they're letting me use it. And the priest didn't even take any money, praise God. Yeah, because you did not preach against sin. And the old ladies who were Catholic sitting there were perfectly comfortable sitting on the front row because you would not talk about Mary. And one of his big problems with me was one day I stood in the Lord's table and I was telling testifying how I was once a Muslim. So I was brought up as a Muslim and how Muhammad cannot save you. And up until that point, I had never, I didn't do the Lord's table as often. I had never mentioned it from the Lord's table, not once. And unbeknownst to me, there was a Muslim man sitting there. Didn't come in again after that. First time he was ever there, came in with one of the lads from Nakhlashin. And I was accosted, not face to face, but on email. And because of the things that, um, I had said because, oh, that guy, you know, he preached against sin. That guy's never going to come back. Saints of God, that fella's trying to make this way broader than it could ever be. If he preached against Mary, you won't have such a good reception from the Catholic priests in this hour. We have great love, great charity for all those sinners outside, but we have to preach the gospel. And if the gospel offends you, then it's something wrong with you and not the word of God. We preach an undefiled, unmixed word of God. And if mixed ever comes in, we so long for it to be taken out. You know, last week I preached something and two people independently, not in this church, came to me and asked me about it. Say, hey brother, what, what did you mean by that? And I had no problems whatsoever clarifying what I was saying and I stand by um, what I said, but maybe it needed a little bit more color and a greater picture. There's nothing wrong with that. If you have questions, there's nothing wrong with asking. You know, I'm, I'm going back and forth with Keith on the, on the uh, content of what I'm going to preach today. Yesterday, Keith and I were 
were kind of wrestling over it, but both saying, he's saying, brother, I'm not trying to dismantle your point, and I'm saying, brother, don't see what I'm saying as insolent, right? We're coming, trying to, uh, trying to um, honestly get the word of God in its truest and greatest form. And saying to God, when a man says, oh, just let the gospel work, don't preach against Mary. There's an aspect of that where I might believe if someone comes in, yeah, you don't jump down somebody's throat. But if you're, consi if you're calling yourself a great evangelist going around this city and then going to use a testimony that the priest didn't take money off you when he let you use his, his, his godless hall, then Babylon is funding your campaigns. The, the Catholic Church is funding you, allowed to go and preach a compromised gospel. We do not want for a compromise. It says in John, like we read, that he that climbeth in some other way is a thief and a robber. If you want to come in to the, to the, if you want to get into the kingdom of God, you better leave Mary down there before you try to get over that wall or come into the celestial city. Mary is not going to be in there with us. Muhammad is not going to be in there with us. Buddha is not going to be in there with us. No packs of tarot cards or my, my wife's uh, former crystal skull is coming with us. That needs to be smashed down at the foot of the cross and then you need to get Get up there and lay it upon you. Saints of God, we preach a straight gospel. But you know what? There's a lot of love here. Anybody that comes here, you don't you miss it when you're on the camera. That that camera, praise God for it, praise God for the for Zoom and all those things, but it is an imperfect media form. Yeah. Jesus did not send the disciples out, right? two by two with a camera and a Zoom login, all right? It didn't happen, okay? They weren't trying, giving people Zoom uh, links for them to join to, and oh, it's okay, you don't have to find a church where you are, all those things. Anybody on this Zoom, you've all sincerely tried as best as you can to find a church and you all desire to be in one. We absolutely understand that, but it is an imperfect form. It is not the way God intended. People have taken issue with us before because of the online meetings, and yet, the online meetings were almost only kept because of those particular people. Saints of God, there must be great love and charity. Very hard to convey charity and love through a camera. The charity and love is here. They used to say of the, the, the great preacher, Leonard Ravenhill, they said he was a lion in the pulpit and a lamb in the pew. And if somebody is struggling, I'm not coming down on you like a ton of bricks. I hope not. If, if you have a story of where I did them, please, and I haven't repented of it, then please tell me. But saints of God, we preach an undiluted gospel because the Bible speaks so much about mixture. Who's going to ascend the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. That pure means unmixed, unmixed not mixed with anything of this world. And saints, I'm finishing shortly. <clears throat> the church nowadays is ashamed of her age. You know, it says in the book of Proverbs, the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old men is their gray head. And it says in Proverbs 16, the hoary head, which means gray uh, head, is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Like Sarah back then, what was she? Ashamed of her age. She comes to Abraham and she says, you know, have you considered, uh, have you considered Hagar? Why don't you know, I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm not sure that God's going to fulfill his promise in me. There's no way that this is possible through me. And it's looking less and less likely. And even when we do have kids, I'm going to be too old. So why don't we have children? Do you know, she says to Abraham, why don't we have children through Sarah? But the problem is they're not her children. They're not God's children. And of course we understand not, there's nothing against adoption, but they're not the got children of promise. That's not the nation that God intended. He will make a nation from those people, but that's not the nation that God had intended. The church is ashamed of her age. I know of a, rich of a church with a very rich history, but, uh, um, but because the original name of that church that was nearly like 60, 70, I, I think it goes almost right back to the Pentecostal revival in America. Um, and because the old, the, the old fashioned name of that church was too traditional, they changed it for a more modern name. You know, something with a little, little more jazzy. Might bring in the tears a little bit easier. Might bring in the young people a little bit easier. That old church, that was, that was too, you know, Revelation 3. We're thinking about something more easy for the young people to understand and all those things. Saints of God, that's a church ashamed of her age. And yet, 
The Bible says that the hoary head is what? It's a crown of glory. When we look at that old path, we should be able to say, that's where my father walked. And that's where my grandfather walked. And that's where my grandfather walked. Oh, see that? Look, the fence was knocked down a little bit there. We repaired it. That fence there, that was a little bit torn down. That's where they tried to build a road across our old path, but we stopped them. We protested. We knew that this old path had to remain. Saints of God, that hoary head, it is a crown of glory. You might hear people say nowadays, the King James Bible is too hard to understand. Young people don't like old hymns. Repentance from sin is not the message that people want to hear. You can't expect people to come every meeting. You can be saved and still sleeping with your partner because God understands your heart. Or you should stop, you know, uh, you can continue gambling uh, when you come to the Lord because, you know, uh, uh, God, it's between you and the Lord. I wish all of those things we're just hearsay, but they are all things that I've heard people say or that I've heard of people having said or that I know have been affected in, in, in all of our homes and different lives and all of those things. One time when I first, I wasn't saved, but I was first coming to the church and I loved it. I absolutely loved the challenge of the gospel. You know, people used to say, you know, you hear people say you have to be like the world to reach the world, but I had the world. What I had in the world was far better than the church was ever going to give me, right? I never came to church for parties because the church is never going to be able to match the parties of that world the Bible says that Moses left the pleasures of sin in Egypt so that he could suffer with the people of God the, you know it, it doesn't say that, that, that he made the wilderness just like Egypt definitely not, far from it he says that he took them out that they may serve God in the wilderness in the wilderness saints of God and so I came in and it was the challenge because I was smoking my brains out living my own life chasing after the lusts of this world trying to uh, live my life the way I wanted to live my life and yet there was a man standing in the pulpit preaching the word of God I knew he could not know the sin that I was actively involved in and yet he knew the sin that I was actively involved in he preached an undiluted gospel and it cut me to the heart cut me to the core <laughs> I was like that woman at the well in Samaria and in my mind thinking, man, this is a man who's telling me of everything that I ever did. It wasn't the preacher saints, it was Jesus. Jesus was talking to me. Christ was speaking to me and he was saying, come, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. He didn't say that there is no burden. He didn't say that, there, 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 you know, he said it's easy and light. He says, your life right now, you, th you like it, but come serve me in the wilderness and there's glory forevermore. Come be a priest and a king. It was the challenge of the gospel that drew me to God. It was the challenge of Christ that made me desire him. If I came to a church and they said, Thursday night we have worship nights and I get to go to a worship night of music that I don't even like listening to, that I'm supposed to pretend is godly and pretend is, is fun. Saints of God, where was I going back to? Straight back to the lasers, the lights, and the smoke machines of the world. That's where I was going back to. Absolutely. I did not desire that thing. And yet we say we must be like the world. The church is ashamed of her age. Those old paths, saints of God, is the way that we must come. And we should not be ashamed where the path is mucky and the path is miry. And the path might be difficult at times. There might be peppered with the slough of despond like in Pilgrim's Progress. We should not be ashamed that we say, yes, the path might be difficult here, but there is glories forevermore. You want to be a king and a priest, you're not going to get there accidentally. You're going to get there by going on the old paths, by following the word of God. Very simply put, very simply put, and to conclude, we know that in the end, Sarah and Abraham by faith gave birth to Isaac and was the son of promise. But because of Sarah's, because of uh, Sarah's idea Ishmael was born the Bible says that Ishmael was a wild man and he was against everyone that came against him and that's what they had to put up with why because they deviated from God's plan and you might say oh God many are they increased that trouble me and many there be that rise up against me and many there be that say of my soul there is no help for him in God but if you're the reason that all those people are troubling you, can I tell you that it's your fault and not God's? That's not to say you can't take it to the Lord, but you've birthed an Ishmael and you've birthed something that's wild, very difficult to hold on to, very difficult to take control of, something that's rebellious and will live for 13 years against everything you try to do to fulfill the will and purpose of God. We must be so careful 
about what we introduce into the body of Christ. This new idea didn't come from Abraham, nor did it come from a Hagar, but it came from Sarah herself. We must be circumspect of our own hearts. What does the Bible say? The, the, the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all else. What does that mean? It means desperately wicked means uncurable, like it's terminally ill. And then deceitful means misleading. It's actually misleading. So you could think, this is the Lord, this is God. I know that we have to start a deliverance ministry in LCC. <laughs> if it's God, then maybe it might, they might tell Keith, might, God might have told Keith, right? You know, people have told me, oh, God told me this. Well, he didn't tell me, all right? So you just keep praying in faith. Saints of God, all of these things, where, where, all of these things can be established in the mouth of a number of people, in the mouth of the elders and all those things. But that's why, the, what does the Bible says? It says, in the counsel of many, there is wisdom. He doesn't just have free reign to do whatever he wants here. You know, he's the leader of this church, but again, he's one member. And if he says, so, okay, I'm getting an electrician in the weekend, he's getting the smoke machine put in under the platform, and we're getting a, a nice big, you know, Blu-ray screen and, and lights and stuff, you know, he's going to have to contend with Paul and I first. We're going to withstand that man his face in love but say brother you know not sure the smoke machine is what we need here saying to God because he doesn't just have free reign yeah he's the leader he's the pastor but he's not the head of this church Christ is the head of this church and Christ's will is the direction in which we go and seek after we don't follow after Keith Malcolmson if you're listening online God help you if Keith Malcolmson's who you're following after Christ should be your head and that's who we and us as members we hold up the head that's what the Bible talks about if you're dissatisfied with what God has given to you or your, current, or your current situation, then take it to the Lord directly or come speak to the elders of the church or to your church or the key to whoever's there. That's what God has intended. Don't do what Sarah did. Don't go from big, huge deviations. You know, like uh, Brother Clendenin talked about this old ship called Zion on its way home. Old ships, they don't move quickly. You know, they just very slowly, you know, they just very, very slowly, slight deviations. And it's the same with the things of God. You know, if it comes super fast and it's really intense and very impulsive, often it may not be the Lord. That's not to say it always is, but leave those things to people who are walking with the Lord like Keith, 30, 40 years. I've seen Keith act in an erratic manner, but again, that's the exception, not the rule. He knows from experience when you must move quickly and when you move, must move slowly. And our problem is we often move quickly and not slow enough. If we're the majority of the times, it's quick and fast. Whereas really God wants us to be sl swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to move, you know, slow deviations. Don't speak on God's behalf and cause your humble, husband to stumble. We must be patient and wait on the Lord because what he promised, he will do. Let's stand. Father, we worship you, O oh God. We glorify you, O oh Father. We thank you for all that you've done, O oh God, and praise you, O oh Father. Lord God, for this great salvation. We thank you, O oh Father, Lord God, that what you've promised, Lord, you will do, O oh God. And we can hold fast to your promises, the word that come from the mouth of God. We ask you, O oh Father, will you have your way, O oh Father? Lord, we ask you, O oh Father. Lord, will you move, O oh Father? Lord, we pray, O oh God, help us, O oh God, not to become impatient like Sarah, O oh Father. Lord, but to be patient and wait upon you, O oh God. Lord, does your word not say that him who waits upon the Lord shall not be ashamed, O oh God? And Lord God, we don't want to be ashamed shame this day, O oh God. Lord God, but we want to glory in you, O oh Father. Lord God, and we want to recompense a great reward, O oh God. Lord, for those that wait upon you. Lord, we ask you, help us to wait, O oh God. Help us, O oh God. Lord, to hold fast those old paths. Hold fast to the word of God, O oh Father. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name.